Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This morning we preached about the joy is in the tidings. The joy is in the tidings. You can't allow yourself to be determined by happiness. Happiness will always let you down. But the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Amen. I thank the Lord for the fullness of joy. Amen. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now I have that everlasting joy down in my soul. Amen. Since the Lord saved me, he is our prophet. He is our priest and he is our king. Amen. The joy is in the tidings. Tonight, I want to I want to speak to you about uh, giving a gift. And um, obviously, uh, this is the time of year we think about those things. But tonight, I want to speak to you from a different perspective. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would, have, would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Basically, the scripture is saying if the enemy had known better, he wouldn't have he wouldn't have crucified the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Amen. We want to talk to you for a little bit about giving a gift. Um, Satan obviously was created as a being, but he shares none of the attributes of the Almighty God. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent, and he's not omnipotent, uh, meaning, meaning that if he's not those three things, then he is actually limited, limited in knowledge, he's limited in space, and he's limited in power. A lot of times we, we give a lot of credit to the enemy that he does not deserve. He cannot be at the same place or different places at the same time. He's not. He's not omnipresent. He doesn't have power over you. He's not all-powerful. God has all power. And he's obviously not omniscient, so he doesn't know all things. But when it comes to predicting what God's going to do next, Satan has to rely on what he can figure out, what he can remember from the timeless past as he resided in heaven, and then also what is written in Scripture. Please note, though, that the Holy Ghost does not enlighten him of understanding of what's in Scripture. Satan only sees the Scripture as the world sees and not as the mind of Christ. Sometimes we, again, have this mentality that he has more knowledge than he has. He can't figure Scripture out. The Holy Ghost is not going to enlighten him. When you read Scripture, you can read something multiple times, and then all of a sudden the power of his Spirit enlightens you what the Scripture is saying. That never happens to the enemy. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. When it comes, when it comes to understanding the power of Scripture, you need the Holy Ghost to obviously enlighten you about that scripture, and the enemy does not have access to the Spirit of God. And once we understand that the Spirit is what actually gives us understanding, a lot of things start to fall into place. The Apostle Paul pointed out that had Satan known 
what God was up to, he would have never had him crucified. That's what he writes to the Corinthian church. It's kind of like the Lord pulled the wool over his eyes. He didn't have understanding of what Genesis 3.15 was prophesying that was going to take place in the birth of Christ. And all of a sudden, this incredible gift comes to earth, not just to live, but also to die. Sometimes in biblical history, we see that the Lord, he's manipulated Satan. You see that in the cases of Job and Joseph. And sometimes God gave, uh, he gave uh, uh, Satan like a head-on collision. Have you considered my servant Job? What an incredible statement. Have you noticed him that you could actually give him trouble? What? Nobody wants God to do that. God did that for Job. The enemy's reply is, well, you have a hedge about him. Oh, I'll take that down. But what the Lord did not enlighten uh, Satan about is Job had his own hedge. Job was going to respond, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Something about the life of Job. He had an understanding of God, and the enemy had no understanding of Job. You see head-on confrontations at Mount Carmel. Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal in a fire-calling contest. You see other times where Satan is ambushed because he does not have knowledge of what God's going to to do. That's why Micah 5 and 2, when it speaks about the birth of Christ, but thou Bethlehem Euphrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Satan can read. He knew what Micah 5 and 2 said. He knew that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. What he did not know was the timing of the Savior's birth. So in in endless efforts to try to toward the purposes of God to all around the world try to have demonic forces concentrate on the Holy Land especially the region of Bethlehem. Yet he does not know the timing of when that's going to happen. And one reason for this, in, this, this uh, you see throughout, throughout the Old Testament, New Testament, this, this uh, prophetic voice of what is going to happen and, and the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. Satan has no idea when that's going to take place. The first thing God did was choose a man and a woman not from Bethlehem. Satan didn't know that was going to happen either. But rather from from Nazareth, far to the north. Secondly, he saw that the woman's purity and morality would be doubted. The devil can count. He knows it takes nine months to have a baby. But he had no way of knowing about Gabriel's visit to Mary and Joseph of the miraculous conception of that baby. If he heard of all the uh, of all this young this young Nazarene couple, he would have quickly discounted discounted them. And certainly this God from heaven would not have used this this young couple from Nazareth. And he didn't know when and he didn't know how. The third thing is that God was going to arrange 
to move Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem in the time of birth, not as to draw attention to themselves. And when Caesar Augusta pulled, put out a call for a census, census of the empire, it was God that had put it in his heart. This was the first time they had gone to this census. So you have, you have an, Ill, an interesting ordeal. A couple not from Bethlehem. A miraculous conception is going to happen when the enemy does not know. And they're going to be sent on a census journey that the enemy is not in, in knowledge of. Yeah. Proverbs 21 and 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. God planned how he was going to do this. And Satan didn't know. He didn't know. So Mary and Joseph are among the thousands returning to their ancestral homes for a census. And perhaps the roads experienced a, a primitive form of gridlock because the Bethlehem Inn is filled. And the young couple took the only thing left. The only thing left to be offered was a stable. Luke 2 and 7, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because he, there was no room in the inn. The devil's vigilance could have never predicted that this king would be born in a stable. There was there was no idea that this would be even possible. And so here you have the setting, a young couple from Nazareth, a miraculous conception. They're going to his senses. The inn is filled, and they're in the stable. This is what Paul writes. In 1 Corinthians 1 and 27, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. This is a basic lesson of spiritual warfare, which historically Satan seems incapable of grasping. And to this day cannot have the mind to understand what God was doing. Yet when Jesus was born, God prepared a welcome committee. A welcome committee of the lowliest people on the planet. Shepherds. Primarily, primarily to reassure the young parents that all was well. Satan had no way of seeing, no way of seeing the angels that appeared to these sheep herders that night or to hear their clues of how to identify the baby. 2 and 12 of Luke, and this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. The enemy could have never fathomed. See, you and I have an understanding full of the Spirit of God. You have an understanding that this king was born in a manger. This was, this was way out there. The people didn't believe it, and the enemy didn't believe it. And God chose these shepherds by being visited by an angel. There's nothing or unordinary about shepherds going to a stable. Nothing seems out of line with that. that that's not a way out there. The, the village looking for a stable. No one's... Uh, thinking that's weird. Later, Joseph moved his little family into a house in Bethlehem. A delegation 
of foreign visitors arrived. The Magi from the east had created no small stir in Jerusalem as they naively announced their search for the newborn king of the Jews. Matthew 2 and 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen this, or his star in the east, and are coming to worship him. This was not a way out there for the Magi to say we've seen a star in the east and we're coming to worship him. They're coming to present gifts. This was actually going to finance Joseph going to Egypt. This was all planned. The enemy could have never figured out what God's doing. This wasn't all of a sudden they're going to show up with gifts because, you know, they, they wanted to walk for whatever distance. No, no, God, he already has it all orchestrated. Joseph and Mary are going to need finance to live in Egypt. And these objects that are brought are part of that finance. And Jesus grew up a normal Jewish childhood in Nazareth. He was not some super boy. No, he just know, he he grew up in a carpenter's home. What? That don't make any sense. The king of the Jews in a carpenter's home? The enemy has no understanding of all these things. See, you, you tonight have revelation, and you've been enlightened about who Jesus is, and you have an understanding that he's the Messiah and that, that he was going to be born to a virgin and he was going to be born in Bethlehem and, and, and his life was going to be spared. And the enemy has no idea of all of that. The first, that the enemy knows the identity of who Jesus is is the day that he stepped into the waters of Jordan. And he waded out in that water, and John the Baptist baptized him, nudged by the Holy Ghost, as John called out the words to let everyone know that Jesus from Nazareth was the Messiah. John 1 And 29, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus' baptism was kind of his inauguration into his ministries. And the gloves are now off. It's been unveiled that Jesus is the Messiah. It's kind of like the Lord toying with the enemy. Can you imagine? I, there's lots of things that amaze me. It doesn't take much, actually, but this really amazes me. The Lord has multiple brothers and sisters that grow up in the same house as him. Can you imagine growing up in the house? Of the Messiah. Never makes a mistake. Never tells a lie. Is never deceitful. Never speaks back to his parents. Never mistreats his brothers and sisters. Always eats what's on his plate. Can you just imagine that for a second? Living with the perfect child? Yeah, we, you know, sometimes people don't realize that the Lord had brothers and sisters. Physical brothers and sisters that grew up in the house. They're the parents. They weren't gods. They weren't miniature gods. They were brought up in the same home. Same mother. And yet you have this, all of a sudden, it's been revealed. And the enemy realizes this is the actual Messiah. And you can imagine for the next three and a half years, as the miraculous things are happening, 
on a daily basis. And all of a sudden, one of those disciples sells him. And the enemy's rejoice was, it is now going to be over. And off to Calvary he goes, and he is crucified by his own creation and laid in a borrowed tomb. But can you imagine to the surprise of the enemy when Jesus is resurrected and comes for the keys to death, hell, and the grave? And oh, what a, what a turnaround. What an incredible turnaround from celebration to can't believe the eyes. We had him down. We had him conquered. The enemy had no understanding of how that was going to take place. All of that about the Almighty God. Did you know that the devil can't predict what you're going to do next either? He doesn't have knowledge of that. God can read your thoughts, but the devil can't. All he has to rely on is what he can figure out from what you've done in the past. The temptations you've yielded to and the mistakes you've made. The feelings you've expressed and the limits you have imposed on yourself. The decisions that you have made. And he assumes that you're never going to change. He does not see you victorious. He does not see you walking in the ways of the Lord. He does not see you overcoming. He does not see you making a decision to change your direction. He does not see any of that. He can only go on what you have done in the past. Yet God, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. He knows your thoughts. He knows your intent. He knows your desire. He knows your longing. He knows what you want to become. He knows how you want to live for Him. He knows how you want to be used for Him. He knows how you want to be involved. He knows how you want to be filled. He knows how you want to be healed, and He knows how you want to witness. He knows how you want to share His wonderful truth, and He knows how powerful you want to be. God knows everything about what you want to be. There's something that is mightily different from the enemy to God. The enemy is all about what you have done. And the Lord is all about what you're going to do. Let me tell you here on December of 2021, God's focus is on what you're going to be, not what you were. God's focus is on where you're going and not where you're coming from. His focus, hallelujah, is on what you will be and not what you have been. Why not give God yourself? Why not give your family to God? Why not put everything into God's hands? Because His focus is on where and what you will be. So tonight I'm going to share with you about give a gift. Give a gift. It's similar to what the Lord has done for us. He gave a gift. And the enemy couldn't figure out what it was. Where are these people coming from? Who's going to be the young couple? When is it going to happen? And where is he going to be born? 
Who's going to visit? And how is he going to be spared? You can see all through Scripture all the things they tried to do to make sure all that stuff didn't happen. And God's hand was right involved. Are you one of those sneaker, sneaky people when it comes to gifts? Do you come out of the room after everyone's gone to bed to shake? Not you, but the gift. Do you accidentally, on purpose, rip the paper on the corner? Are you one of those people? Just all I can see is your eyes, so I'm trying to read the eyes. Hmm. You shake it. You're trying to figure it out. You try. Are you one of those people that wrap things so the people will never figure it out? You take the little ring and it's in a box about this big by the time you're done. Have you ever done that? Wrap things like 10, 12, 15 times. Just keep wrapping it in something bigger. Oh, yeah, I've done that too. Because I have one of those sneaky people that live in my house. They want to figure it out. Yeah, she's shaking her head. Yeah. I don't wrap anything and put it under the tree because if I'm not home, I don't know. Everything of mine is already hid somewhere else in a different location. I even put things at Brother Robertson's house. Is that true, Brother Robertson? It is. So what about a surprise gift? What about what God has for you this Christmas season? What is it that you can give to someone else that the enemy has no knowledge of? Oh, I'm just going to share a few things. 7.30. Romans 5.15 speaks about a gift of grace. Ephesians 3 and 7 speaks about the same gift of grace. That you and I can express, share, tell someone else about that the enemy has no knowledge of. You can tell someone about the gift of grace and the enemy cannot understand what you are talking about. Oh yeah, we give him a lot more credit. He has no revelation of, of, of how powerful the grace of God is. He's not very smart at all. He'll do all kinds of things to try to mess up people. It only takes one moment in God's grace for their lives to be turned around. He'll spend years of trying to ruin someone's life uh, and distract them and, and try to detour them. And it only takes one moment uh, in the grace of God, uh, hallelujah, for their lives to be turned uh, upside down. The enemy's not very smart at all. How many years has he wasted on some of you? that are in this place tonight, and all of a sudden, uh, you came in contact with the grace of God, uh, and just one moment uh, of that contact, and your life changed forever. Why don't you tell someone this holiday season, this Christmas season, about the grace of God, because that's a gift that you can give that the enemy has no knowledge of. Can you, you, you tell me if I'm a bad person. I always had this deal that I said that if my wife or my kids found out what they were getting, I was taking it back. 
Is that a bad person? I heard yes. Yes. That's why I hide them. I don't want them to find out. I don't want to have to take things back. Do you know how great a person you are? If you offer the free gift of grace to someone's life that is totally messed up, they got no hope, they got nowhere to turn, they've been trying everything and nothing seems to work, but yet you spend just a few moments with them and tell them what God can do for them and what he did for you and how he can change your life and turn your life Transformation that takes place, that's a gift that you can give that the enemy has no knowledge of. Okay, First Timothy, coming to a close. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, talks about all kinds of things here. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example. This is you. Be an example of the believers. First of all, in word. You can tell people about the word of God, and the enemy has no knowledge. He has no revelation of word, conversation, charity, spirit, faith, purity. These are things that you and I can be examples of, and he does not understand how powerful that is. You can give a gift that he never will find out what it's about. All of a sudden, he comes to a realization, I thought I had them almost destroyed. I thought I had them at the end of their rope. I thought that their life was going to soon be a total disaster. And yet, just one time, they went to church. Just one time, they had a Bible study. Just one time, someone laid hands on them, and they received the Spirit. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't. That's what his knowledge is. Take back all the credit you've been giving him. He's an idiot. He doesn't understand how powerful the gift uh, that you can give. Uh, look, look at verse 13. Every, right, let verse 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. These are things that he doesn't understand. Verse 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Hmm. The moment your life changed, he lost control. The moment you said, God, I'm giving you my heart. He no longer had any say. The enemy had no longer any say at that very moment. The moment you realized that you were purchased, you were bought, it was paid for, you no longer had to be what you were. The moment that you realized that your life could be different and you could have a new direction and you could change. The moment you realized that you had a future and a purpose and God had a plan, the moment that he filled you with his spirit, the enemy lost control of what you would ever become. You don't have to succumb to the enemy's devices. You don't have to succumb to his temptations and his ways of thinking. No, no, no. Hallelujah. He has no power and no authority over you because you can give gifts that he has no knowledge of. That all happened because the 
recipe, the plan was put in place by the Almighty God who gave us a gift that the enemy couldn't figure out. He couldn't fathom how a young couple from Nazareth would be on their way to a census who were pregnant and he had no knowledge of how that could ever be. The inn was going to be full and the baby was going to be born in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes and an angel was going to visit the shepherds And tell them, something powerful has happened tonight. I want you to make your way to worship this Messiah. He has brought gifts that finance his safety. In Egypt, grows up in Nazareth to a carpenter's son goes 30 years basically under the radar and all of a sudden all hell breaks loose because they realize who the Messiah is. That's the life of Christ. You could have been born, music come. You could have been born to just about any type of family. Some were born into difficult homes. Some have had challenging upbringings. Some people's lives have been detoured by the challenges of life. Some people in this room were drinkers. Some people were addicted. Some people lived a lifestyle of immorality. Some people came from broken homes and broken marriages, broken families. People in this room tonight, there's things that in your past that you probably wouldn't be proud of. Maybe things you haven't even shared with anyone. And all of that, Seems like it had you destined to a life of turmoil. A life where your your future would be determined by what the world would say. And then someone told you about a gift. Oh, it wasn't wrapped underneath a tree. Oh, no. Oh, no, not even close. Someone told you about a gift, an unspeakable gift, that if you opened that gift in your life, your life would be changed forever. Pieces would be put back together. Brokenness would be restored. Addictions would be Delivered and bondage would be set free. Emptiness would be filled and the longing would end. You came in contact with a gift. A gift that the enemy had no understanding of what it would do to your life. Testimonies could be shared tonight about that very thing. If we only had a glimpse of where we would be without the Lord, I think we would quickly realize how blessed we really are. People's lives abused, used and abused. But one moment with that unspeakable gift 
and your life changed forever. And what the enemy had as a plan totally changed when the unspeakable gift was realized. And tonight you sit in this congregation or you watch online or you're listening tonight because you have, you have experienced the gift. I think about it often. What if a pioneer preacher C.B. Dudley had not have listened and come to the little town that I grew up in. Would I know the Lord today? Would I be standing in front of you as blessed as I am if someone had not have brought and shared that gift that the enemy has no knowledge of? Just a couple months ago in October, the fourth generation of our family was baptized in the exact same spot on the exact same date, 61 years apart. Four generations were baptized in the precious name of Jesus. And the enemy had no say. He had no say. He couldn't stop it. He couldn't do anything about it. Cold water didn't even stop us. The gift was realized. So I encourage you tonight that over the next week that you share the gift of grace, the Word of God, have a conversation about His love, His Spirit, faith, purity. Exhort to someone shared doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee which was given to you that the enemy has no say of all the things that you could give to someone this season give one of those things the enemy doesn't know what you're up to God is preparing the next person each and every day you can make an intentional effort to say God put someone in my path this week each day that I can share give a gift to that the enemy has no knowledge He doesn't know your plan. He doesn't know your thoughts. He doesn't know what you're going to say. He doesn't know how you're going to share. He doesn't know how it's going to affect the person. He doesn't know how their life's going to be changed. He has no knowledge of their future. If you're one of those surprise people, like me there's nothing more rewarding than to surprise the enemy by giving a gift he has no knowledge of oh that is that's so exciting (laughs) you can wrap up grace and share love you can express the purity of God the Word of God, the Spirit of God, the faith of God. You can tell someone about it and they 
It can be changed in just a moment. God, I thank you for each person that is here tonight. God, I've gone longer, gone longer than normal. But there's something so precious about the gift that you gave to us. We want to give that gift to someone else. God, it was shared today. 170 meals were passed out today just to let someone know that we care about them, love them. Someone was baptized in your precious name this afternoon, God. And the enemy had no knowledge of what took place. I pray, God, over the next the next week that in the busyness of our day God we would stop and realize that we can give a gift to someone else that could change their future forever praying for a healing for someone that the enemy can't stop Praying for someone to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost that the enemy has no control over. Praying that someone would experience grace and mercy and God's love that the enemy can't understand. Oh, God. Oh, God. You feel like giving a gift? You feel like giving a gift tonight? Would you stand right now? Everybody, social distance to the best of your ability. Are you a gift giver? Someone who will give a gift this week? Someone who will give a gift this week that the enemy can't stop? Would you step out of your pew? Make your way to this altar tonight. Would you find a place of prayer in your pew? Would you give a gift this week? Would you pray, God, give me, give me the ability, God, to provide a gift for someone. Give me the ability, God, to, to tell someone, God, about a gift that the enemy can't stop. Would you do that tonight, every young person? Oh, Pastor, so proud of you tonight, young people. Hallelujah. You're, you're the best gift givers. Hallelujah. That's it, young people. That's it, adults. Hallelujah. Would you be a gift giver this week? Hallelujah. Would you give, give a gift to someone that the enemy has no knowledge of?